Welcome, this is Dr. Ron with the Cybersecurity Update, and this is for professionals, students, researchers, and all of us who are interested in IT, IS, and cybersecurity. The four items that we'll discuss today, number one, federal cyber mandates for water infrastructure are too costly to implement, experts say. Number two, universities urge to defend sensitive research from hackers. Number three, Iranian state actors conduct cyber operations against the government of Albania. Number four, Colonial Pipeline Ransomware Group using new tactics to become more dangerous. Those are the four updates we'll go through today. First off, federal cyber mandates for water infrastructure are too costly to implement, experts say. A U.S. House of Representatives hearing heard expert testimony need for enhanced funding to support cybersecurity measures in water utility providers, especially in rural regions, and that was September 21st. Witnesses emphasized the significant challenges of applying more robust cybersecurity technologies to water infrastructure systems, specifically in underserved communities. Here's the essence of it, the quote, Managing a strong cyber defense is just as much a part of our infrastructure as maintaining our pipes and filtration systems. Robust planning for cybersecurity is no longer optional in the water sector. It is a key part of what we do every day. And that's from David Gaddis, the CEO of DC Water, who testified at the hearing on September 21st. Federal regulations place a disproportionate amount of strain on utility companies to comply with cybersecurity measures without adequate funding support. The U.S. EPA released a report to Congress entitled Technical Cybersecurity Support Plan for Public Water Systems, a report to Congress in August of 2020. A link is provided in the reference section for your review. CISA is tasked to lead a national effort to understand, manage, and reduce cyber and physical threats to the U.S. infrastructure, including water systems. Voluntary pilot program has been established to define the following items. One, cybersecurity best practices for industrial control systems. Two, securing industrial control systems. Three, addressing the rising threat of all technology sets. And four, the Stop Ransomware Initiative. Now, each of these is to us the rising tide of threats to our water system. And our water system is comprised heavily of SCADA systems as well as IoT-related devices. The testimony to Congress indicated that federal engagement and partnerships, private entities, organizations, can result in ample funding, which are key to a stronger cyber defense and creating a resilient water infrastructure. The bottom line with this is mandating role and funding is inadequate for the partnership is a recommendation. It needs good cybersecurity practices, including such items as layered architecture, zero trust architecture, and VM, including items like layered architecture, zero trust architecture, VLAN, and IP segmentation, for the IoT and SCADA devices that we mentioned. The initial initiative is training. The bottom line is training and the human resources to provide that training at no cost. And that is a quote by the National Rural Water Association Senior President, John Arnold. Item two, universities urge to defend sensitive research from hackers. Hey, an area close to my heart, certainly. Increased cyber attacks against universities and colleges have forced academia to implement new rules to handle sensitive data. Now, as you can imagine, sensitive data, you have intellectual property, you have personally identifiable information, all the other types of information that a university hosts, but really this is focused on the research side. So as an example of the initiatives placed to secure data, Texas A&M in 2016, quite a while ago now, established an office to oversee the security of the security around scholarly activity. Now that's interesting. That's the way the article wrote it, the security of security around scholarly activity. Anyway, that being said, it was uh, a mandated disclosure of all foreign collaboration, a notification of foreign travel and approval. My apologies for the glitches on the slides here. Establishment of a continuous network to monitor and identify foreign actors and the establishment of a review approval cycle to approve all research collaborations. We've seen a lot of our intellectual property walk away to uh, adversaries, Iran, China, etc., through student work. So a lot of these research projects are funded through DOD, NIST, the Department of Education and uh, Department of Health Services, etc. And it's kind of unfortunate that a 
lot of our research is walking away at no cost to our adversaries. The U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee hearing wins quote, understand aberrators is the most critical aspect of our research security program in that way from Texas A&M. So another quote by the NCSC director, William Finia, higher education should be looked at as part of the National Security Defense Program. Well, that makes a lot of sense if you consider the source of funding, DOD, NIST, etc., and where that research ultimately is geared towards DOD, NIST, etc. A few highlights include, quote, understanding our collaborators and their funders is the most critical aspect of our research security program. That's from Gamachi from Texas A&M. Further, quote, higher education should be looked at as part of the National Security Defense Program, said former NCSC Director William Avina. Setting a security standard for universities. The recommendations are, lawmakers should set a minimum standard around what constitutes acceptable security for any research institutions that are either federally funded or receive federal subsidies. The FBI and DOC set up their own unique programs. FBI has led an effort by going all in on initiatives such as the Academic Security and Counter Exploitation Program. The DOC, Department of Commerce, also has related criteria similar to the FBI's criteria. However, this is not an overarching set of standards for cybersecurity yet, and that's what the recommendation really points to. The crux of the matter regarding universities is implied in this statement, quote, international scholars in our universities enhance innovation and knowledge, but also present risks. Partnering with federal agencies to mitigate existing and emerging threats, educate our researchers, and provide clear avenues to address security concerns is critical and crucial, Gamachi said from Texas A&M. The bottom line is we have to keep in mind that compliance is coming but also that compliance does not necessarily mean being secure. Item three, the Iranian state actors conduct cyber operations against the government of Albania. Let's look at a timeline of this attack. July 2022, Iranian state actors, and they call themselves Homeland Justice, launched a destructive cyber attack against the Albanian government, which, by the way, is a NATO member. Uh, that rendered websites and services unavailable. An FBI investigation indicates the Iranian state cyber actors acquired initial access to the victim's network about 14 months before launching a destructive cyber attack. The attack included a ransomware-style file encryptor and a disk wiping malware. The actors maintain continuous network access for approximately a year, periodically assessing and exfiltrating email contents. What's interesting to note here is this takes on an, a trajectory that many ransomware actors execute with. That is, they'll get into your system, they may lurk for a while, escalate privileges, exfiltrate some data, and at one point in time, in this case 14 months, they may launch the hard-hitting attack. May and June of 2022, the Iranian state actors conducted lateral movements, network recon, and credential harvesting from Albanian government networks. July 2022, Iranian actors launched the ransomware on networks, leaving an anti-Mujahideen e Khalig MEK message on desktop. When network defenders identified and began to respond to the ransomware activity, the cyber actors deployed a version of zero clear destructive malware. June 2022, Homeland Justice created a website and multiple social media profiles posting anti-MEK messages. July 18, 2022, Homeland Justice claimed credit for the cyber attack on the Albanian government infrastructure. July 23, 2022, Homeland Justice posted videos of the cyber attack on their website. Late July to mid-August 2022, social media accounts associated with Homeland Justice demonstrated a repeated pattern of advertising Albanian government information for release, posting a poll asking residents to select the government information to be released by Homeland Justice, and then releasing that information either on a zip file or a video file screen recording with the documents shown. In September 2022, by this time, Albania had severed ties with Iran over the cyber attacks. So the Iranian cyber attackers launched another wave of cyber attacks, again using the same trajectory as was done in July. The bottom line includes cybersecurity training, protection of key information assets, the proper filtering of traffic, both ingress and egress, layering of the network architecture, and the use of zero trust architecture, ZTA, which is essentially trust nothing, verify everything. This could have resolved or at least addressed a portion of the issues with the 
Albanian government infrastructure. Okay, our last item, item four, Colonial Pen Pipeline Ransomware Group use, is using new tactics to become more dangerous. Now, looking in the past, Colonial Pipeline had a ransomware attack in May, May 7th, 2021, and it cost them 75 Bitcoin at the time, or $4.4 million. They paid the ransom. Semantic noted that Core ID, and we'll talk about Core ID in just a second, has adopted a new version of its data exfiltration tool and is offering more advanced capabilities to profitable affiliates. We'll talk about that as well. The new version of this ransomware is called Noborus. Some history affiliates, by the way, are likened to subscribers of the Core ID network. Think of Core ID as RAAS, ransomware as a service. Also involved are Fin7, Carbon Spider, many operations involved as ransomware as a service. Uh, they develop operations that uh, support ransomware tools and services, and then they also collect money from affiliates, subscribers, who use the tools to carry out the actual attacks. And as we talked about before, I could go out on the dark web, anybody, and pay for a ransomware as a service, several bitcoins, and receive a support center, also receive a some sort of cost-sharing uh, paradigm 60-40 split on uh, ransomware is, is a scheme that I've seen before on the dark web. And of course, I don't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't. Some history and background. The initial group that attacked uh, was called Dark Side. They changed their name to Black Matter after Black Matter was shut down. The initial group that attacked was known as Dark Side, the group behind the ransomware attack. They rebranded themselves as Black Matter, but Black Matter was later subsequently shut down in November 2021 because of law enforcement pressure. The offering, e.g. ransomware offering to Core ID's affiliates, is now tied to Norberus. Norberus is, think of it as a software suite, and researchers indicate that it is a greater threat to than the initial. The offering, the ransomware offering to Core ID's affiliates, is now titled Norberus, and researchers indicate that it possesses a much greater threat than the initial attack software. It is the Think of it as a software suite that's offered. The bottom line with Norberus being more dangerous is it's more complex. It challenges both victims and law enforcement due to the complexity of the tool. It offers two encryption algorithms and four encryption modes. Any of these methods can be used to encrypt stolen files from a victim. The default method, encryption, uses a process that's called intermittent encryption to encrypt data quickly and intermittently, which keeps it kind of flowing under the radar. Xmatter, now this is kind of an ingenious piece of software. To extract files, Norberus ransomware uses Xmatter, which is designed to steal specific pipes and up those specific file types to the server. So Xmatter uses FTP, secure FTP, or WebDAV, move the files from the host back to the server. Xmatter is designed to self-destruct if it is not executing in a corporate environment, indicating its focus. So its focus is really getting the rich data assets from organizations, and it's really not a concern with dealing small time like me. Another item is this infostealer.eamfo. Now, Norberus can execute an infostealing malware that takes credentials from Veeam, B-E-E-A-M. Now, Veeam is a data protection disaster recovery product that's used by many organizations to store their credentials for cloud services and domain controllers in the event that the organization has some sort of disaster. However, InfoStealer connects to the SQL database within the Veeam product and steals the organization's credentials through specifically crafted SQL queries. And by the way, I do have a SQL course. If you want to go ahead and use that and review it, it's in YouTube. If you can't find it, let me know. I'll send you the links. Incentive View. This is a way that Core ID incentivizes their affiliates. Any affiliate who brings in more than $1.5 million in ransomware is allowed to use a variety of tools, DDoS attack tools, uh, they'll, be, they'll be provided with phone numbers of victims to contact directly, brute force tools, and that could bring in more revenue for both core ID and affiliate partners. That's an incentive right there, huh? <laughs> Laughing. Anyway, protection from a ransomware includes a culture of cybersecurity for the organization. Everyone in the organization should be made aware of the magnitude of cybersecurity for the organization, the cost, the risk, the reputational loss, if you will. And that includes training everyone in the company. Three types of training are suggested, kind of a best practice, cybersecurity hygiene training, and that gets doled out periodically, let's say once every three months or so. The technical cybersecurity training for those who run the systems, and that could be 
not only for those folks working in the in-house IT information systems area, but ensuring that your vendors and your providers are also properly trained in cybersecurity areas. The C-suite, the C-suite, CEO, CFO, COO, they set the strategic goals for the company. So they should have a really robust ongoing training because they're setting goals, two-year, five-year goals for the entire organization. A list of other items to be concerned, a list of other items to be considered includes things like backups, continuous user training, as we've talked about, quarantining suspicious emails, content filtering tools. There's a whole list of those items. And CISA has a whole list on protecting ransomware. Look on their website. So that's a wrap. Thank you. Any feedback, thoughts, comments, please post them in the notes. Also, please like, please share, subscribe. Subscribing will give you notifications. Keep in contact in any shape or form, whether it's via email, uh, text, my LinkedIn page, etc. I'd love to hear from you. And by the way, I do have the references. I'll post them in the YouTube comments. Here's item one, two, three, and four. And thank you again. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you soon. Bye now.